this this panel, panel two, is the uh, the role of health care costs in the income inequality debate, which, uh, as you know, has been a very prominent feature of political discourse in this country and really throughout uh, throughout the world, where health care and uh, income issues are uh, are prominent. We have we have uh, three excellent people to give us commentary today. Uh, we'll structure the this panel as indeed uh, Chuck structured his. Each panelist will give about 15 minutes of uh, presentation. There'll be a little bit on the screen, so be attentive to that. Uh, after which we will have an opportunity for uh, questions and, and uh, hopefully answers. Sometimes there are questions without answers. I, I'm always ready for that. Uh, let me introduce each of the panelists uh, now, and then I'll turn to them separately as, as, we, get, as we go forward. My colleague, uh, Mark Warshawski, will lead uh, this panel. He'll be the first person to speak. Mark is the Senior Research Fellow at Mercatus, where he specializes in just a number of topics uh, gifted in a, in a host of areas, including pension, retirement, and health care policy. He's a prolific writer with over 150 scholarly art articles and several books. Um, I met Mark uh, when he was served in uh, 2004 through 2006 as the Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy in the Treasury. And that's where he led the fight for the Pension Protection Act of 2006. He was a member of the Social Security Advisory Board from 2006 to 2012 and was vice chairman of the Federal Commission on Long-Term Care in 2013. He has a BA from Northwestern and a PhD from Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Fetter, Judith Fetter is our, our second presenter today, a, a long-term acquaintance of mine, and I think of everybody in this room. Uh, professor of Public Policy, uh, and from 19, uh, 1999 to 2008, served um, uh, with in, in served in the McCourt School. I don't know why I have tr <laughs> trouble. Tr tr <laughs> served as the dean. I have trouble with just say, saying the word dean. I don't know why. why. Must be a lot of academics. Uh, yeah, must, must be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. it's uh, I just saw the word and I froze. I don't know why. Um, uh, served as a dean in what is now the uh, uh, McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Specializes in healthcare and health insurance industry. Her research in this policy area began at Brookings, uh, continued at the Urban Institute, and since 1984 has been pursued at Georgetown University. She served in the Clinton administration, has been a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and now is an inst institute fellow at the Urban Institute. Dr. Fetter has degrees from Brandeis and Harvard University. Uh, not a Harvard man. <laughs> Richard Berkhauser is the uh, Sarah Gibson Blanding Professor of Public Policy of Public uh, of uh, Policy Analysis at Cornell University. He specializes in how public policies affect vulnerable populations. Uh, I uh, served with Richard uh, for many years on the Academic Advisory Panel of the Pew Charitable Trust and their Economic Mobility Project. Um, he joined the Cornell's Department of Policy Analysis and Management in 1998. In 2012, he began a joint appointment as a professorial research fellow at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research at the University of Melbourne, which is in Australia. And he divides his time now between there and Cornell. Dr. Burkhauser has degrees from St. Vincent's College, Rutgers University, and a doctorate from the University of Chicago. And with that, Mark, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, I wanted to today uh, go over a, a paper that I've written um, looking at the connection, and it's a very intimate one, between earnings inequality and rapidly rising cost of employer-provided health insurance. This is one of the measures of economic well-being, which our prior panel actually did not mention. Uh, they mentioned many others, and they're all very relevant, but this is one that they did not mention. Um, and it is, uh, it is very, uh, you know, the research that I've done and the empirical analysis that I've done has shown that uh, there is a very close connection. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, heard and uh, read about uh, very many studies that have looked and have documented an increase in measured inequality, whether measured by earnings or income, um, and measured from tax data, 
from uh, Social Security earnings records, uh, other, other measures. Um, they all have problems, uh, some, you know, perhaps some flaws, um, particularly the tax data has its unique uh, characteristics. And I think maybe Ri uh, Richard will, will discuss uh, some of those a little more. But let's just take those facts as given, that there has been an increase in, uh, we'll say we'll focus on earnings, earnings inequality. But is that the sort of the end of the story? Because people don't just get paid earnings, they get paid benefits. They get paid compensation, which includes pensions, retirement benefits, and most prominently and most significantly, health insurance. And at the same time that we've seen this in increase in, in a measured inequality, we've also seen there's a very rapid increase in the cost of health care and the cost of health insurance. And the employer pays for that. Um, and so, and, it, and it's been very rapid. And we'll discuss at the end what, what more recent data shows about those trends. But looking at, let's say, the last 20 to 30, 40 years, I think there's no question that it has been a very rapid increase. And the question is, is there a relationship? And just a moment's thought, a little almost simple arithmetic, would, would indicate that there would be a very important connection. Um, and that's as follows. And we're going to see this basically again and again. You're paid compensation. Your employer pays you. He pays your earnings, and he pays you your benefits. Um, Health insurance, it, by its nature, is, is sort of, it doesn't matter whether you're, to a first degree approximation, doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, your employer pays the same amount, whether you're a high income worker or a low income worker. In fact, by law, by the tax code, within the same employer, they're not allowed to discriminate between different earnings uh, workers. They have to provide the same insurance package, uh, the same health insurance package. With, but, as a proportion of compensation uh, for the low earning, earning worker, that health insurance is going to be a much higher percentage of compensation than for the high income worker. Therefore, if increases, if health insurance costs increase, it's going to have a bigger impact on the low income worker than on the high income worker because the employer, after all, pays the marginal product, um, you know, for the workers. Uh, high, uh, the high income worker presumably is higher marginal product, the low income worker is lower marginal product. Uh, the, the money has to come from somewhere. Um, and if it's, not, if it's going into the cost of health insurance, it's not going to go into earnings. And so therefore, um, the earnings growth for the low income worker will be slower than for the high income worker. Um, and lo and behold, this is, a, as I say, simple math. Um, but let's sort of try to find it in the data. I looked uh, for 1999 to 2006 uh, using a unique data source for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, which is um, superior to many other data sources in this area because it's not a um, survey of workers, which have sometimes has a lot of errors in it. It's not a compilation of different data sources matched up, which is almost like assuming the results. This is a consistent data set, comes from surveys of employers, it's done by the government in a very, very careful way. And lo and behold, you know, looking at the data from 1999 to 2006, it was exactly, uh, exactly uh, confirmed that the increase in inequality, measuring inequality of earnings, was entirely due to the increase in uh, the cost of health insurance, the employer-provided health insurance. Now, the key assumption is that the share of health insurance in compensation of the lower paid is larger than for the higher paid. Again, it's sort of an obvious point, but it's a, sort of the, the, the key thing. So um, here is a, a, a chart. This is looking at more recent data uh, from 1999 through 2016. And it sort of shows this point without looking at different percentiles of, of income earners. It looks overall. So basically what you hear, here you see is, is the point that the um, increase in the cost of health insurance has a share of earnings uh, of compensation increase from 6.1% to 8.4%. All other benefits, no, no change. That led directly to an, a decline in uh, the share of earnings, what the take home pay, what the worker actually sees, from 81% to uh, 78%. So that's sort of at the macro level. And now let's look at it, for, you know, at looking at it at the micro level in terms of uh, different uh, percentiles of, of workers. I look at between the 30th percentile and the 99th percentile. In other words, the, the top 1%. The 30th percentile represents basically around the minimum wage 
uh, full-time worker is in that range of 30th percentile. And this is looking at data from 96 to 2008. And the reason why I chose these, these years was because a, a Brookings study, uh, which was on, this, uh, on a similar subject, um, uh, using entirely different data, lo looked at these years, and I, I also wanted to, to sort of match up that study. And again, you know, it, it uh, just sort of reads exactly according to the, uh, the simple math explanation, the simple economic explanation that I've laid out. Uh, so, actually, in fact, let's look at the, at the bottom of, of this, this chart, the growth of earnings and compensation, so that for over this period, the lower income worker, their earnings increased by 45%. For the highest income worker, 52%. So that's, that's the Piketty, that's the uh, concern about inequality, that's what you know, everyone is talking about. But when you look at compensation, which includes the value of benefits, in particular the value of health insurance, their compensation was pretty much grew at the same rate. So that the, there was an entire crowd out of the increase in earnings for the low income worker um, uh, by the cre incre increased cost of health insurance. But for the high income worker, because of course it represents a much smaller percent of, of his or her pay, it was a much smaller crowd out. Um, so, you know, you might say, well, this is the end of the story, but let's continue to look, look at uh, other time periods and other, uh, other, other, uh, other ways of looking at the data. Here I expand the, the time period of, of the analysis to looking from Mar uh, March 92 to March 2010. And I chose these years because they were similar year points in the business cycle. Uh, clearly the recessions and unemployment uh, have a big impact on earnings. Um, and um, so you want to control for that. So the way, easiest way of doing that is looking at the same points in the business cycle. So this is uh, just after the recessions, uh, when um, pretty much the bottom of the recession and just coming out of the recession, so both in 92 and 2010. Uh, it's a longer period of time, so you wouldn't expect to see, you know, as, as a, a nice fit. Uh, but basically, I think you see the story is still held. And so again, let's look at the bottom of the panel, that uh, earnings growth for the low-income worker over this period was 60%. For the top 1%, it was 78%. Um, looking at compensation, for the low income worker, it was about 70%. And for the top income worker, the top percent, um, it was uh, 82%. Um, again, not, not entirely explained by the increase in health insurance because you have a longer period, there's more going on. But at least half of the, of the relative um, holdback of the low income worker in terms of their earnings growth is again explained by the, by the decline, uh, by the rapid increase in the cost of health insurance uh, provided by the employer. Uh, I did a, a simple regression. Uh, I won't go through the details, it's in the paper. Um, but I, you know, it's a simple regression, so it's, it, it tries to c control for a couple of factors, and particularly the business cycle. Um, it has, uh, has, it's a nice, nice result. It's pretty, pretty, uh, uh, Pretty robust, uh, and here too, it's, again, it shows the the, the finding that um, for the same increase in the cost of health care, uh, the the negative impact on the low wage worker um, is negative 66 percent, point six six percent annually, compared to for the high income worker of point point uh, three percent. So again, it sort of demonstrates the the point that earning the cause of the earnings inequality. Uh, uh, problem uh, is largely uh, because of the uh, increase in the cost of, of health insurance. So um, I, I think uh, many, you know, there's a debate as to how significant um, uh, this policy point should be about income inequality and earnings inequality, but I think we all agree that there's something there um, and that there's something to, to be concerned about. But then the question is, how do you deal with it? Um, you deal with it through redistribution policy, tax policy, other government policies, or why not direct deal with it directly? Deal with the, the cause, which is the increase in the, in the, in the cost of, of health care. Um, and in fact, this was one of the initial stated goals of Obamacare. Uh, it has not been mentioned much, but it was to, to quote unquote, bend the curve, which was to control the cost of, of, of health care for everybody. And that would have had a good impact on this inequality issue. 
Uh, and here I want to make a, a point which is basically in disagreement with some of the prior panels, particularly uh, Jason Furman. Um, if you look at government data uh, from, the, from the Health uh, and Human Services uh, Department, basically the health uh, expenditure accounts, um, I think he had a somewhat different story than what he presented. And this is the latest data. The more recent data is not available. In 2014, U.S. healthcare spending increased 5.3 percent, following growth of 2.9 percent in 2013, to reach $3 trillion or uh, $9,500 per person. So, in fact, we have seen an increase. Of, uh, this uh, this lull in the increase in, in the cost of healthcare was very temporary. It was just 2013, for whatever reasons. I, I think it's not well understood. But basically, we're back at the rapid increase in healthcare costs. Um, and so what to do about it? So um, like the many on the panel, I think tax policy is an important uh, consideration. And I, I'm in the school of cutting back on the favorable tax treatment of health insurance provision by employers. I think there needs to be strict enforcement of antitrust laws in the healthcare sector. And I think we do need more scope for consumer sensitivity to cost in the design of the health insurance uh, programs, both public and private. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, Dr. Federer. Thank you. Um, Mark, I'm glad that you brought back this dimension of the challenge of the relationship between health costs and inequality. We can look at big picture and focus too much on, on, on budgets or focus only on budgets or not a small problem, productivity, other issues. But I think you're talking about human consequences in terms of well-being, and it's a, a, a real problem um, that we know we have actually known for a long time that health cost growth has con is contributing to, um, to diminished incomes, essentially eating up wages. And that's what you very nicely demonstrate. Um, and indeed, our health finances, financing system is a major problem. Jason called it a vexing problem. In social science, we often call that a wicked problem. And um, to fix that wicked problem, you get to solutions. Um, I want to dissect the issue a little bit more than uh, what you're looking at, both by going back to the bigger picture of health financing that we discussed this morning, and also making some finer distinctions in the relationship between health insurance and inequality lest in trying to fix this problem, we actually make matters worse. I want to start by reminding us that insurance, independent of the way we choose to finance it, and those are two different things, is, as Matt Fiedler reminded us this morning, protection against risk. That, and that protection mitigates inequality if it protects people at the lower as well as the higher ends of the income spectrum. The fact is that prior to enactment of the Affordable Care Act, the nation's health financing system systematically excluded low-wage workers along with non-workers, many non-workers, from that protection. And that was not an accident. It was a function of policy and market decisions made over decades. Nor was the Affordable Care Act's approach to addressing that problem an accident, as I'll get to. But first, let's talk about the emergence of employer-sponsored insurance as the core of our health insurance system. That approach, different from any other country, advanced industrial country's approach to providing health insurance to its citizens, emerged in the 1940s as health insurers discovered that by marketing to large employer groups, they could beat the challenge of risk selection, because large employers essentially constitute what we might think of as natural risk pools, that the, as the employers then in, in that period increased uh, fringe benefits because of wage controls on, during World War II, and employer-sponsored insurance premiums received favorable tax treatment, which was codified in law in the 1950s, and that now exceeds a cost to the Treasury of, of more than $200 billion a year, and that labor turned from looking for government to provide national health insurance to the bargaining table to gain benefits alongside wages for their members. 
The dramatic growth of employer-sponsored insurers in the insurance in the 1940s and 1950s led advocates for government-sponsored national health insurance to alter their political strategy, laying the foundation or actually creating what became the necessity for the Affordable Care Act. Rather than challenge employer-sponsored insurance, uh, which by the mid-50s um, and, and, and in the 1960s had grown dramatically, advocates for universal health insurance targeted their efforts to expand insurance for the population that employer-sponsored insurance wouldn't cover, largely, predominantly, the elderly. It was easy for them to argue that employer-sponsored insurance would never reach that population, and the government had to do the job. And though it wasn't at all easy to enact, Medicare was born, along with Medicaid, to cover what we might call, what were considered, the deserving poor, people in our historic welfare categories, predominantly kids, pregnant women, and people with disabilities. The pre premise on which proponents sold Medicare was that employer-sponsored insurance would cover the working population. That was working, they, ar they argued, while government would take care of people not expected to work. It was, that was clear for the elderly, and Congress added the deserving poor to wall off future expansion of Medicare. Advocates of government-based national health insurance, though aware this was a risky strategy, because they still had their eye on getting every, everywhere, they figured they'd overcome that risk and later extend Medicare to kids and then to the rest of the population. But their action further fir firmly entrenched employer-sponsored insurance as the primary source of health insurance coverage for the working population, despite the fact that millions of low-wage workers never got it. And I just would remind us that two-thirds of the uninsured population pre-Affordable Care Act were in working families. Now, low-wage workers were doubly harmed. They were excluded. They were not getting employer-sponsored insurance through their jobs. Low-wage jobs were not high-benefit jobs. They were lousy jobs and they were too rich and not in a deserving poor category for public protection through Medicaid. And given the nature of the non-group market, plagued by the risks of adverse selection, that arrangement left everyone, not just low-wage workers, at risk if they got sick, lost a job, got divorced. We all know the litany of problems with the non-group market. But with 85% of the population insured pre-Affordable Care Act, that risk was not terribly salient, especially to the majority of the population who relies on employer-sponsored insurance. Opponents of expanded government protection raised what they per perceived as an even greater risk to this population, that if we expanded coverage to get to everybody, it would disrupt the coverage that people who counted on employer-sponsored insurance already had and had come to count on. Hence, the political strategy behind and the design of the Affordable Care Act. Again, just as in the 1960s, public, in public policy left employer-sponsored insurance intact. I mean, what the president really meant when he said, you could, if you like your policy, health insurance policy, you can keep it, he was talking about employer-sponsored insurance. And the law built a new marketplace outside and around it, and but for the Supreme Court decision, created a Medicaid floor of protection, not just for people some that we have historically treated as deserving poor, but everybody below, with incomes below a, specif a specific thresh threshold. Those actions fundamentally mitigate inequality, extending insurance protection to low-income people and benefiting people of all incomes, not only but by providing health insurance, but by reducing what's often referred to as job loss. You don't hear that much anymore. Facilitating economic mobility and entrepreneurship for people who were previously tied to their jobs to keep their health insurance. It's no surprise, then, 
that the ACA does not mitigate the inequality promoted by tax-supported employer-sponsored uh, employer insurance that is at the heart of our nation's health financing system. But as you note, and the discussion in general has indicated, the heart of that problem is cost escalation, not insurance. Just as our policy choices left millions uninsured over the course of the uh, 1900s, it left us without a public policy mechanism to constrain what our insurers pay providers, the fundamental driver of health care costs. Only after two decades of basically paying providers whatever their costs were or their charges were, just like private insurers, did Medicare rein in its payments with greater vigor and success than private payers. The ACA goes further in that regard, as we talked about this morning, aiming to develop new payment systems for use in both the public and the private sectors. Cost growth has slowed dramatically. Yes, it's gone up, but after several years of very, of historically un, never for, before seen low rates of growth. But it's true that the jury is still out on the innovations in payment and the cost problems that underlie the inequity of our employer-sponsored insurance financing system remains with us. So what do we do about it? It's easy to focus on, as has been much of the discussion this morning, on the upside down nature from the perspective of inequality of the tax break for employer-sponsored insurance. But lest we think this problem is easily solved, some would say eliminate it, though I noted that was not said this morning, the discussion was to cap it. I want to remind us, as we think about that, of the natural risk pools that employer-sponsored sponsored coverage provides. What are we going to do without them? Are we going to regulate the whole market? How much? And with what impact on the role of insurance in pooling risk and, in that way, mitigating inequality? And lest we think that eliminating that tax subsidy and pursuer grading price sensitivity would solve the problem of health cost escalation, I want to remind us that cost sharing in employer-sponsored insurance is already growing rapidly, perhaps stimulated by the tax on high cost plans. And given evidence that out-of-pocket spending leads to reduction of necessary as well as unnecessary service use, it behooves us to worry about under more than over insurance. Indeed, if we're to have insurance that mitigates income inequality by protecting consumers of all incomes adequately against risk, cost containment can't come from less insurance. It has to come from focusing on how and how much public and private insurers pay providers. So, what to, oh, and I wanted, I had a note to remind myself, the focus this morning was all on reducing unnecessary use of services, but we have just as much a problem with price of services, which is a much harder problem to tackle, paying too much for the service. So, what to do to promote health insurance and greater equality? Politics aside, which is a little like asking Mrs. Lincoln, otherwise how did she enjoy, enjoy the play, I just would note that if we moved to a single payer system supported by a progressive tax, promoting equity through risk pooling and financing and cost containment could be accomplished. That would be a trifecta. But that's not what I'm here to advocate today because I've been in politics too long. Back to our political history and that investment we've made in employer-sponsored insurance, I don't see that in the cards. So, where am I? I'm with the architects of Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act. We're kind of stuck with a fragmented public-private system, but it has to be one that assures meaningful insurance protection and more equitable financing, and I would say that the path to that is to enhance the ACA's subsidy for low and modest income people, progressively financed, and tackling the wicked problem of health care costs by better managing provider payments in the public and private sectors alike. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was, that was, that was terrific. Um, Dr. Burkhauser. <clears throat> so, 
So uh, Bill uh, asked me to uh, summarize uh, a 12-year debate about the change in income inequality and how it's measured in uh, 15 minutes and eight slides. So since I am from the University of Chicago and not Harvard, I think I can do that. <laughs> uh, so I think that uh, all of you have heard of uh, Piketty. Uh, some of you have bought his books. Few of you have read it. Uh, but if you did look at it, or you looked at the works of Piketty and Sayers, you would uh, see this U-shaped curve. And what this curve says is that uh, the share of income held by the top 1% of uh, tax units uh, was very high in the 1920s. It uh, declined uh, throughout the, uh, the period. And then it began to rise again in the 1980s. And now it's at uh, historic highs close to what it was in, in uh, 1928. So what I want to say to you is that's both true and irrelevant to how resources are actually allocated to people in the United States. Uh, and just as an aside, uh, part of the increase in the, uh, in the uh, uh, numbers here are for a particular period, 1986 to 1988. And this is one of the useful things about being uh, alive in the 1980s. Uh, how could uh, the share of the top income increased so dramatically between just two years, 1968 and 19, uh, 1968 uh, 19, yeah, 19, excuse me, 19, uh, where do I have it there? Uh, yeah, excuse me, 80, 80, 86 and, and uh, very good, okay. Uh, how can that happen? Well, it happens because uh, uh, President Reagan made a deal with the uh, uh, Democratic Congress to uh, dramatically lower uh, the marginal tax rates on high-income people uh, for the first time below the corporate tax rate. That allowed people to actually pay less in taxes on personal income than on corporate income that they got through being doctors and lawyers and other things and getting it that way. So what we saw was a rapid increase in the taxable market income of people, and that explains uh, a good deal of this change. But uh, that aside, uh, if you now go and think about this for a second, what did Piketty say is actually measured? They measured uh, taxable income, which in the United States is market income, um, income from wages, uh, rents, dividends, that sort of thing. It does not take into account uh, government taxes that uh, redistribute income, and it most especially doesn't include government transfers, either in-cash transfers or in-kind transfers. And here's where the health business comes into play. What we've had since uh, the 1960s is a dramatic increase in the two major sources of resources for uh, uh, Americans. That is the uh, uh, government transfers, and that is the old age uh, 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 survivors and disability system, which provides cash to older people and people with disabilities, and that's increased from about uh, 180 billion in 1966 to over 700 billion, and that's in real terms, uh, 2012 terms. And uh, in uh, what Judy just talked about, uh, the uh, creation and expansion of Medicare and Medicaid, which in 1966, the first year it went into play, was 20 billion and is now greater than uh, OAS uh, DI at 751 billion in 2012 dollars, and it's still it's higher today. So none of this is captured in market income as measured by Piketty and Sayers. Okay, so uh, I've written four papers on this, uh, which you're welcome to read. I'm gonna just assert things, but if you don't believe me, read those papers. Uh, <coughs> let's look at the most common measure used by the Census Bureau uh, in their uh, use of survey data. Uh, and in uh, one of those papers, I show that you can uh, get the numbers that Piketty and Sayers get with a tax-based uh, uh, data with the survey data. But what the, what the census does is look at median income. And what you see is a median income has increased substantially since uh, uh, the uh, 1967 is what, uh, where we go. Uh, uh, the, the, the shaded areas are um, uh, recessions. So what you see is median income going up and down uh, through the business cycle, but uh, fairly uh, su substantial progress in median income between 67 and 2007. What you see since 2007, which is in red, is the Great Recession and the decline in median income that has only just started to turn around in the last uh, 
uh, uh, year's data from 2015 that the census showed two weeks ago where median income is up, uh, up uh, uh, substantially, but still way below what it was in 2007. Okay, so uh, what's going on here? How, can, how, how do you uh, relate uh, tax income, market income, to what's going on with uh, a median, uh, the median income of people uh, more broadly measuring income? So, so you can think of uh, uh, five measures of income. The first is market income, and I should say Mark's work is, is even before market income. He's looking at the wage income of individuals. What uh, Picking Sayers are looking at is the market income, not only wages but uh, uh, income, uh, rents and dividends, and looking at tax units, which uh, can be single people or, or families. Uh, so uh, the first uh, measure I'm going to talk about is market income of tax units. Uh, the second I'm going to talk about is the uh, uh, income uh, uh, pre-tax, uh, post-in-cash transfers of uh, households. The third I'm going to show you is the way that uh, most uh, uh, researchers do it, where they take into account the, that there are uh, different numbers of people in each household, and I'm going to use the individual as the unit of analysis, but, but look at household income divided by the number of people in the household to uh, a power to uh, adjust for uh, uh, returns to scale in, in consumption. The fourth, I'm going to do what the Europeans do and subtract taxes off that income because people can't spend taxes. That's what the government takes away from you to spend stuff for you. And then finally, I'm going to show how all this changes when you include something that's not included in most numbers, and that's the uh, market value of employer-provided uh, health insurance, which is what Mark talked about. And I'm going to add the uh, uh, insurance value of Medicare and Medicaid. And this is not how much you as an individual get if you uh, uh, have a, a health condition, uh, it's really the insurance value that protects you from all of those uh, conditions if you uh, have access to Medicare or Medicaid. Okay, so what I'm gonna show is fi these five things, and I'm gonna show you that, if I can just move over here. Uh, if you focus solely on market income, then you get a very dismal picture of what's been happening in the world. The rich have been getting substantially richer between, and I'm going to show this between 1979, which is a business cycle peak, and 2007, which is a business cycle peak. I'll later talk about expanding that back to 1959 and up to 2012. You see the top 5% uh, gets 37.9%. Uh, the rich are getting richer. Here's the amazing number. The bottom 20% of the income distributions, income fell by 33% in real terms between 1979 and 2007, a disaster. And the middle, the middle of the distribution, their income only increased by 2.2% over the entire 30-year period. Stagnation. The rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and the middle class is stagnated. Have you heard that statement made? Okay, so now let's move this across. And nothing up my sleeve here. Uh, I'm just going to shift from tax units to households. This is the number, this is the measure I showed you uh, that uh, the census does. Uh, this changes a bit because uh, we have in-kind trans or in, uh, in cash transfers to individual households, and so that minus 33 immediately changes to a positive number. But still, the rich are getting richer, uh, just slightly increases by the poor and the middle class a little bit better, but not all that much. Now let's do it household size adjusted, and also include uh, uh, pre-tax post-transfer uh, income here. Uh, but not health insurance. Uh, we're going to do household size adjusted. Excuse me, household size adjusted. This changes a little bit, but uh, not dramatically. Then we go to uh, taxes. When you include taxes in here, actually, the, the higher income people do better off here because the share of your income uh, that you pay taxes on has actually decreased between 79 and 2007 for everyone. But now you're seeing that the other numbers increase. But here's the big change. This is not measured in, 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 in most evaluations of health care, although the CBO, beginning in 2012, in part because of the, some of the work that I did and Gary Bertlitz did, are now beginning to use these kinds of measures in their uh, evaluation of, of where resources go. You see that uh, the bottom 25, uh, the bottom 20 percent uh, income doubles uh, because of the tremendous importance of Medicare and Medicaid for those folks. Uh, it also improves for people at the upper income levels because of uh, the value of employer provided health insurance. Okay, uh, what I now want to show you is some new work that I've done uh, going back uh, 
all work uh, in this area really begins in 1979 because that's where the data is to get uh, measures of the value of uh, in-kind transfers, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, employer-provided health insurance, and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, in-kind transfers, food stamps, that sort of thing. What you see is if you hold uh, income at the same level uh, and so we can just look at trends, you get a pretty dismal picture of market income. This is the one I talked to you about. If, uh, if uh, we valued at one here in 1979, by 2007, it's only gone up by about uh, uh, two percentage points. But then you see this d dramatic decline so that market income actually fell between 1997, uh, 1979 and 2012. And if you take it back all the way, it's even, it's even worse that uh, uh, these things have been happening. Uh, uh, market income actually hit its peak in 1969 and has been going on a steady span uh, at a flat level. But what's been actually happening in terms of people's resources is that uh, they've been going up as uh, the uh, uh, importance of in-kind transfers, the uh, uh, redistribution of income from market income to, uh, to people who have less market income has offset this steady uh, uh, market income trend. And as a matter of fact, and this is important, if you look at 2007 as the peak, uh, because of government, uh, because of the safety net, which has mainly since 2007 been, in, been through tax uh, credits and through uh, in-kind transfers, uh, you see that it's, it's, we haven't had the kind of dramatic drop there. Uh, what we have, though, and these are the glory days, between 59 and, 60, and 67, we have substantial increases in market income between this period, and we had even better increases in government transfers. So this is the glory period where you're, you're having market income increasing and uh, government transfers occurring. But uh, part of that was because of the unique position the United States was in in the 1960s and the 1950s. Uh, and market income has not increased since then. OK, so final, final uh, point. What does it look like if you actually take into account the last major four recessions in the United States? And look at what happened between 79 and 82, which is those double-digit uh, recession uh, of that early 80s, uh, market income plus the value of employer-provided health insurance fell by 8.11%. Uh, if you measure the Great Recession using this measure alone, the Great Recession was actually worse. It fell by almost 10%. But if you crosswalk this across, as I've done before, we didn't, in 1979 and 1982, have the uh, uh, important redistribution that went through the tax system and uh, the uh, value of in-kind transfers and health insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, so that uh, the uh, government mitigated the decline by a bit, but only to 5.74%. If you look at what actually happened in the Great Recession, uh, all of these measures that are not calculated actually dramatically uh, uh, reduced the decline in market income to almost, uh, well, to almost nothing, 0 0.021. For the bottom quintile, it's even better news. It was 25% decline uh, between 79 and 82 to 12%, and it goes from 30% to 1.31%. So what does this say? We have a very weird way of treating uh, uh, health insurance, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. We count it as a cost to government, but in our measures of it, we never put it into the value of people's access to resources. Now, that doesn't say that uh, that's the best way we should spend our money or that if we were going to give the bottom 20 percent uh, resources, it should be in this uh, way of doing, providing them lots of uh, 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 insurance against health issues. Uh, but what it says is these are real resources. And you have to take those into account. And if you, don't count, if you don't count them, you get this strange notion that the United States has somehow had stagnation and, and uh, the top 1% is taking all the resources. That just isn't the case. And doing this allows us to think a bit more about, do we really want to do this sort of thing? We've really done great things, but do we really want to spend all that money uh, 
on the health sector uh, and on providing protection for uh, health insurance if there are alternatives that uh, people would prefer uh, more of. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much indeed. I'll give you a chance to. So as you're preparing your uh, questions, I have, uh, I'll, I'll do what Chuck did and take the prerogative of the chair to ask one question. Um, and, and honestly, I, I, uh, uh, I'm disappointed that I didn't hear this term because it's my favorite term, and that's economic mobility. Um, uh, it seems to me so oftentimes we talk about distribution of income, but in, a, in an economy with healthy change between the bottom and the top, with, with people moving up and then the top falling down, with all of that churning going on, if that's healthy, isn't that what we ought to be looking at? mobility as opposed to any kind of static dis distribution. Um, now that's just my own view is whether we ought, we ought to be looking at that as opposed to di di distribution. It's an odd thing I'm moderating a panel on dis distribution, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but let me pose this question to the, to the panel. Uh, how has rising health care cost, uh, costs affected mobility? A any of you have a, a view on that? Well, uh, I'm going to answer the first part of your, your, your point, and that is, um, you know, economists and government analysts will often take the easiest thing that is available to them, and the data, I mean, tax data measures market income, and that's available, um, and so they use it. So it's, in, to some extent, it's, it's, a, it's almost a supply <laughs> explanation of the data. Um, what, what is unique you know, and what I did, and, and, and Richard obviously has done much more of it, is that it's harder, but it can be done to look at other, other measures of resources, and it comes up with a different story. Mm -hmm. um, so that, this may be an explanation as sure, to, sure. and economic mobility is even harder to measure. Uh, it's not to say it's, it's uh, impossible, but it, it is very, very challenging. Um, you know, in terms of this, your second question, in terms of how this affects, um, uh, economic mobility. I mean, there was, there has been discussion about job lock that having health insurance uh, locks you into your job, um, and and I think as Judy noted, it sort of died down a little bit. That that uh, I don't know if it's because people think that it's not as important mm -hmm. perhaps as it was in the past. Um, um, but uh, you know, I I I, uh, I, I, I think um, you know we have to deal with the system that we got and the and the data discussion that we've got. You bet. But in, in, that, in that vein on the job lock, the, I've not seen any analysis of the implications of the Affordable Care Act for people's mobility in that respect. But the availability of health insurance outside a job, um, outside your, uh, a large employer, or the ability to switch jobs, um, the ability to move off Medicaid um, is, is, is altered by the Affordable Care Act. So I've not seen an analysis of its implications, but it ought to have positive results. It, it should, yes. Let me just take you back to a bigger picture of things. Uh, if we're, I, I think it is important to think about economic mobility. I think econ economic mobility is ultimately it depends on the resources, the human capital that you bring to the marketplace. And I guess what I worry about is that uh, I've shown you that uh, we've done great things in terms of providing health insurance to low, uh, low income people, but uh, question is, uh, at what cost are we doing this? What uh, Doug, Holtzakin, Doug Holtzakin talked about this morning was that we have structural deficits in this country that are really quite scary and we haven't really talked very much about them. How are we going to pay for all the promises we made for Medicare and Medicaid? Uh, but what I think is a problem is that when you have these automatic increases in the budget, things that are, that are not automatically in there get crowded out. So I would say if we want to do something about mobility, what we need to do is put more money into education, less money into, into health. But before you do that, you need to understand how much money we really are putting into health, how much we're already uh, uh, mortgaging, in some sense, uh, the younger generation's uh, uh, opportunities by uh, not only redistributing income from the current cohort of people who are alive uh, to take care of the low incomes low-income people currently health care, but the deficit uh, that we're building on that uh, on the system right now. Let me just just probe on that point for just a second. If uh, if uh, as you point out, Mark, uh, health care is one of the features which is, re I guess to say the term, retarding 
uh, income growth in the bottom half of the income or what, whatever portion you've been focusing on, would that also be retarding their ability to develop their own human capital? Uh, almost certainly because they, um, I mean, if, since so much of their compensation is sort of locked in um, it's, and it's not coming in terms of earnings, if it, uh, therefore they don't have the extra resources um, either for education or any, any training um, that they might want to pay for themselves, um, uh, you know, to get a better job or to switch careers. Um, I mean, there, it's just still a limited and, and not growing budget. And so therefore it would have, it would uh, sort of naturally have that consequence. You see that? Uh, certainly, I've got uh, no problem. I don't think that you'd get any argument with anybody who has been here this morning mm. um, that we are spending too much as a nation on health care. Where the argument comes is what you, where, what you do about that um, and where the problem lies and how you address it. And I would argue differently, I believe, from what Rich would argue, that it is not to, it is, I argued it already, so I'll just repeat my argument. It is, it is not to give people less health insurance. They need that health insurance. And in other countries, they get that health insurance for a much lesser share of, of public resources. So the issue is how to provide them that insurance, that protection, at lower cost. And that focuses, I would argue, largely on the way in which we pay providers. But there's a vicious circle there, isn't there? I mean, uh, if we're allocating too much for health insurance, as you've argued, let's just put that out there, and we have a... That's too a much low for health care. Health care, excuse, excuse me. Yeah. And that's a, a low productivity sector, doesn't that sort of bake in a lower overall growth rate in the economy? Doesn't that rebound then to the slowness in the wage growth, which gets us back to slow economic mobility? Well, I'll let I'll I'll let the Chicago and Harvard economists <laughs> talk about that. But what I, as a Harvard political scientist, would tell you is that I'm focused on the value. Right. Remember that having access to health care, um, and we know that without adequate insurance, there is inadequate access to health care, which is also a hell of a price to pay in human capital. And so I believe that I would argue that that is a valuable um, service that Americans, like everybody, needs. Sure. And I, I believe we ought to focus on making it work economically, no, not think, taking it away. That, that sounds good. We'll, we'll uh, uh, open it up now for, for, for questions. If you have a question, uh, raise your hand and wait for the microphone to get to you. And identify yourself if you wish, or if you wish to use someone else's name, no one's going to know, right? <laughs> um, so uh, uh, do whatever. Uh, 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 Richard, did you have a view on this whole business of the way it kind of loops back into uh, income growth? Is that one of the reasons we're seeing, uh, you know, families merging with other families to create this, you know, these affordable households, as you were pointing out? Well, I certainly think that uh, <clears throat> focusing on the individual is inappropriate because people live in households, and households, in fact, do provide that kind of insurance. Right. Uh, but I guess what I would say is that there are two, <laughs> we get back to what we were talking about this morning. There's sort of two ways to approach this issue of whether healthcare is expanding, uh, whether the prices we're paying for uh, health insurance are too great. And uh, one, uh, one solution is more a, uh, a single, uh, that one extreme is a sort of single payer mm -hmm. uh, approach where the government would in fact regulate uh, uh, the markets and determine the prices and allocate the resources. The other is to uh, have individuals have more direct decision making in terms of how they would uh, use their resources to purchase these kinds of uh, products in the marketplace and that's the more notion where you subsidize individuals, uh, have let let them have, uh, uh, you know, uh, tax-free some amount of money, and uh, subsidize low-income people who don't have uh, have income, and then let uh, let greater market forces control the, the prices of uh, mm. uh, healthcare. Wow, B Bill, if, yeah. if, if I might, I, I wanted to sort of comment on something which Judy said um, in terms of her her history of. Um, of uh, health insurance and uh, employer-provided health insurance. And I don't disagree with anything, but I think she didn't go far enough back. And that was that the creation of health insurance in this country, the Blue Cross Blue Shields, were actually created by 
doctors and hospitals. Um, and, um, you know, later on, because of the, you know, we'll say the accident of price controls and wage controls, it sort of glommed on to the employer. Um, and then there's the question of the risk pool. But originally it was, it was designed, um, you know, by the providers. And, um, you know, I think in their self-interest. Um, and, and so, you know, I would agree that we need mechanisms to, you know, provide the resources for people to, provide, to get their health care. Um, but it doesn't necessarily even need to be insurance. Um, you know, there could be other mechanisms. Um, and I think the, you know, the part of the difficulty of, and, you know, I think this was addressed by the prior panel of having the government do it, it's sort of, the government is by its nature cannot provide, um, you know, um, custom sized um, and, and innovative uh, solutions. Um, I think the, the private market is much better equipped to, to come up with innovations in terms of, I mean, HMOs was an innovation, it was an innovation of the private sector. Um, and, and there no doubt are many other innovations that could be, could be, uh, could be tried. This whole, this whole morning has been devoted to the question of uh, the relationship between the pace of economic activity, the fairness, the equity of economic activity, and our health care system. Um, I don't exactly remember his name, Judy. You probably remember him from Harvard Poli Sci. Was it Robert Scott? I don't. Uh, uh, well, he, uh, he, was, uh, he was very famous in the early 80s, uh, uh, mid-80s, early 90s, for the proposition that inevitably uh, countries evolved to uh, a regime where they emphasize security more than they emphasize growth. Um, and uh, it's a kind of a classic argument that you see in both economics and in political science. Uh, uh, is, is one of the implications of where we are in this debate right now that that we're really debating which of two branches we want to go or is there a third branch where we have a health care system that can pro provide for a three to three and a half percent inflation adjusted growth rate which most people would argue is the right kind of level of growth rate for an economically mobile uh, society. What, what do each of you think about it? I think it might be a good a good way to conclude this, this, this morning on the kind of a a, large, a larger question like that. Uh, uh, I was looking right at you, Judy, the whole oh, time. So, so okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take you, it. You, you can either go first or last. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, no, maybe both. <laughs> both. <laughs> what, um, I don't think that's where we are. Okay. I think that we need growth, um, and we are, I, I, we are facing an aging of the population mm -hmm. um, and a, a cost to some of the services that we're talking about that is substantial. And as a nation, um, I believe we can handle that. Other nations have, have, are aging faster, and they're handling it. Right. We need to do it, too. That requires growth. It, what is enormously hard, which is why it's called a wicked problem, is to tackle the health care, the, the growth in the cost of services per capita, okay. what we're paying for health care. Right. And it is, I, I would take issue with what innovators the private sector has been, and I, don't, I think you wouldn't exaggerate it either. Health insurance has not been a bastion of innovation. It's been a bastion of avoiding risk. Mm. Um, and that is, that's not an acceptable way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I, what we need, and we are struggling with it, at the moment, but we are we are beginning to address it more than we've done in the past. Is working with changes in the delivery system to make it more efficient, but that's also going to involve changes in the prices, the rates we pay providers, and that is one hell of a challenge for us as a nation. Has always been starting with a system that was developed. You're absolutely right in provider self-interest, and now everybody is invested in it, doesn't <laughs> want to give it up, and it's a very tough challenge to achieve our objectives, which I believe are quality health care, affordable health care, and equitably financed health care. Wow, that sounds like, it almost sounds like the last word, but I'm very tempted to say, does which University wants the last word. <laughs> Chicago or Harvard here? I'm all Georgetown. <laughs> You're Georgetown now. Uh, uh, well, let, let me just say that yeah. what we have is a problem of scarcity of resources, and it's fine to uh, say that the prices are too high, but I spent six months of my life in Australia. It's much cheaper to get things done, but you have to wait for them. Yes, so right. if you have a hip replacement, 
it, you don't get it uh, next week. And you is get that it less cheap? Yeah. That's that's right. So so it's yeah. it, that dimension too. Do we really want to go towards a single pair system where we're going to be where time is also one of the uh, mm -hmm. things that's in the right. in the mix? I just need to respond because I I as you will recall I said that's not where I'm going, and I also think if you look at the measures, and this was not a general, this certainly isn't a health panel, So, I, but I would tell you that if you look at the evidence in terms of quality of care, including ready access to care, you will not find the United States at the top of the list. Yeah. Okay. Mark, do you have a take Yeah, I mean, take it's, take uh, I, th I think it's just, um, you know, I think we're all agreed that, uh, you know, 17.5% of GDP on health care, you know, and, and, and rising is, is simply not, not sustainable. And um, and it causes the you know, budget deficit problem. It causes inequality problem, and um, and uh, you know economic mobility issues, and so therefore I, I think it is it is it is the challenge which needs to be dealt with. Well, I hope uh, I hope all of you have uh, found a few things this morning to take back with you and to enliven your own thinking about this crucial question. Um, I want to thank you all for your attendance here this morning. I want to thank uh, Chuck and the uh, team, uh, the healthcare team at Mercatus for putting this together, Ashley Adams and, and all of her team for uh, facilitating this wonderful morning. And uh, would you please join me in thanking these panelists for their remarks this evening.